No, that's, that's how I say the subject reveals itself to you as we paint. And I can always come back with my background color and adjust things. <clears throat> Put in some of my darkest darks. Because we're getting down to the uh, point where we can say that needs to go darker there. And we've established the background color. Now I'm not going to put the highlight on here just yet. I'm going to continue to block in with the big brush. Notice that I've just used one brush to do all this painting. And I've never really even rubbed it off on my paper towel. I find that I use fewer and fewer paper towels. Now there are going to be areas, I promise there are going to be areas where I have to come in and finesse these things. It may be one of these handles, it may be the top of this. That is okay. But for now, just do the best you can do. Get it blocked in. Get it feel like it's feeling like it's working. And you can even use your brush as that axis line and say, how do those shapes line up? Looks like it might need to come out a little more over here. Now another great thing about something like this pottery is nobody's ever going to say, I saw that vase and it was taller or wider or, or bluer or anything like that. So we have a little bit of artistic license. All right, I am going to wipe off my brush now because it's time to get into our stars, the apples. It's not a bad idea to take a break now and then. Step away and freshen up your eyes a little bit. Actually, one thing I'm seeing is I'd like to come in and just go back into that background for a second and marry it up with the, with the, uh, now that I have the base in there. There's a little bit of light that peeks through over here. I love that stuff and over here, but it gets cooler as it's going towards the uh, end of the, as the light reaches the end of its, uh, where it's uh, shining. So I'll probably have to darken up these shadows too. A lot of times you find out that those early things you put down, they were not dark enough because you were working on a white canvas. Everything is relative in painting. Uh, so, for example, if your studio is very bright, you're going to tend to paint very dark. And if you're painting outdoors, your painting's going to look very dark because your painting just can never be illuminated as brightly as it is when you uh, are outdoors. It'll never be in a gallery or in a home or wherever. It is, it'll never be lit as intensely as it is when you're outdoors. And so if your studio is very bright, that can happen too. And, and uh, opposingly, the, if your studio is very dark, you'll tend to uh, make your paintings a little lighter. So my studio has north light and uh, and it, it, it'll vary, even though it's north light, it doesn't have the rising and setting sun coming in. But um, some days it'll be the darker, it's gotten a little cloudy out here today, which is a pretty nice even light, not too bright and not too dark. So hopefully my painting will be okay. My, painting, my studio tends to be pretty well lit, so um, I do find that sometimes I wish I had just painted a little lighter. Funny thing about artists is you'll see somebody who paint, if you tend to paint a little darker, you'll see somebody who paints a little lighter and, and you'll be a little envious. Or if, you're, if you use more muted color, you'll, you'll see somebody who uses very rich color and you'll, you'll say, boy, I need to do that. And then they're saying the same thing about your work. We always kind of admire the thing that's different than what we do. You paint very loose and you see a tight painter, you think, boy, I'd like to paint tight like that. <laughs> and vice versa. I have a lot of 
very uh, tight painters say to me, I just wish I could paint loosely like you do. So, And I tell them it's the big brush. The big brush is what helps you to paint more loosely or more painterly. Okay, so it's time to start putting in some of that color of the apple. And again, I'm leaving myself somewhere to go. I want to get those dark values in there. And marry it up to the thing in front of it. And that's affecting it. That's why I'm grabbing the blue right out of my vase mixtures and mixing it in with this red. So if I can get these values and these shapes in about the right place, I'll be doing great. And it'll always be real easy to come in and get richer and and uh, even put in those greens. Isn't it amazing how nature has put uh, green and red together on those apples? And it's not the easiest thing in the world to combine those those values so cleanly and perfectly. So remember I talked about mixing to get my darks. This is where I really look at that shadow under that apple and I say, is it warm? Is it cool? Is it darker? And it's also the shadow coming off of the, the vase itself. And how it's darker. And, uh, and these, paint, uh, these paint mixtures that I'm laying down here are definitely uh, thicker and more confident. And I say often when I'm teaching that really what we're doing is observe, mix, and lay it down and just repeat. So that's what's going on in my mind here. I'm observing, mixing, and laying it down over and over and over. I, I often say that when we're painting, we, we must make just millions and millions of decisions as we're going through this process. And even with the control of these boxes, these shadow boxes, that light will change. If the sun comes out, that light will be affected by what's outdoors. And if it starts bouncing off some of the greenery out there, so there's no such thing, even with these boxes and a North Light studio, there's just never going to be such thing as a perfect environment. But I think this is about as close as it gets to a perfectly controlled environment. Okay. So every now and then I just wipe my brush off, but I don't really use the odorless mineral spirits to, to uh, clean it off completely. I'm kind of just moving from one mixture to the next. All right, so now I'm going to come over to these apples over here. Still with the big brush. I did just wipe off my brush a little bit, a little bit of oilish mineral spirit. That's funny, I used to go through hundreds of paper towels in a day, and now sometimes I just go through four or five. And these will be on big paintings, big portraits and such. So I'm going to start with this distant apple. Grab a little white, a little red. Just a little bit of pink up on top of this one. Make a note of that. And I'm also happy whenever I'm marrying an edge to an adjacent edge. It may not end up being the final edge, but it starts to assert where these shapes connect. <clears throat> now this is where it gets tricky because, as I said in my 
value lecture, these apples are light and shadow. And it's particularly tricky when that light and shadow is on different colors, the green and the red going into light and shadow. Now, if you ever are questioning, is it light or is it shadow, just squint. And sometimes you can step back and squint. But that'll answer it for you. And a lot of times our eyes are so amazing that they just, they just don't spend a lot of time on is that light or is that shadow. They just move forward. Uh, that's an object. So as painters, we have to kind of reverse engineer a little bit and say, is that light or is that shadow? So right away, I want to be establishing the difference between light and shadow on this form back here. If I miss it, or if I'm just going back and forth, that, that can be a big problem. Remember Howard Pyle's dictum. If we don't get that difference between light and shadow in representational painting, then we're not going to be able to depict the things we want to depict. So this is actually in shadow at the bottom of this apple. So you got a lot of complex things going on here. You got something that has two complementary colors in it, very bright, going from light to shadow. So I did wipe off a good bit of paint, and I'm grabbing some of this green and white. And I'm just going to lay it in there and see how it starts to work. Thinking both in terms of value color, and even how that paint's working, and marrying those edges. So that's pretty dull, but that's okay. I know I can always get more intense with that green. Uh, that's leaving myself somewhere to go. So let's try to mix up a little more intense green. And even get some yellow into it. Now you don't want to get too off base when you're trying to leave yourself somewhere to go because if you put in something that's just, you know, gray, then you've got so far to go. You want to get into the ballpark for sure. I'm not going to worry about that indentation where the stem goes. I can always put that in. But I just want to get that feeling of form and light on that form and some of that color. And this is, these are relatively confident paint mixtures, you know. I don't need to be timid with my paint here because we've established a lot of serious value. I'm going to come back over to my reds, see if I can't lighten this up a good bit. But you can see how it's just critical to have that feeling of light and shadow. Remember the Hatfields and the McCoys. No color up here is going to be as dark as anything down here. And no color down here is going to be as light as anything up here. It's hard to verbalize. But we just have to build a mental fence with our values. And uh, here's another key factor is we get our richest color very often right at the transition between light and shadow. So sometimes if you think of a, the way a cheek goes from light to shadow on a face, that's where you get your richest bit of color. So that's important for the painter to remember. See, I'm getting a richer mixture here and putting it up there. So it's starting to work. Keep in mind, I'm still working with the big brush. Trying to make those edges meet up and marry. It's starting to take on form. I, I'm sure I will have to continue to wrangle things back and forth. But that's the fun of it. 
I see a little warm now coming up off the cardboard. And any of these notes that you can start to put in with confidence are going to help you. Now remember what I said about the richest colors being at that intersection of light and shadow. So these are things that really start to make things feel real. Remember I had mentioned that there was some light coming through. Now much like uh, holes in trees, the leaves and such, this doesn't want to be as light as anything out here. So I'm just going to start with a value. Got to be a little warmer. But I don't want to be too light. If I'm too light here, it'll really feel like it'll jump out at us. It's probably a little light right now, but I know the foreground's probably going to get lighter as well. So I think I can live with that. And again, leaving myself somewhere to go. So I see that that dark under the apple is darker. Not only does that set that apple down, but it trues up the drawing a little bit. So you can see it's very easy to keep fixing drawing. If you're doing it well, you have the confidence to say that comes in a little bit. So observe, mix, lay it down. That is the mantra. Check that shape a little bit. Well, I think it's happened. I have covered the entire canvas and I'm always happy when that happens, particularly if I feel like I'm in the ballpark. Now instantly I can look at things and say this needs to be adjusted and that needs to be adjusted. For example, this needs to be adjusted. It needs to get a little lighter. And I need to true up the shape of that shadow. And the warmer I get, the more that's going to come forward in space. So I am always happy when I feel like I have this block in, in relatively decent shape. Because that just means that you've got to work out towards that, that last stage that I re referred to, which is calling it done. Now, I probably won't be done for another three or four hours. But as long as you feel like you're on the right track, that's a good feeling. And this is not the time where you'd want to find out that your focal point is right in the exact center of the canvas or something. That would not be good. You want to, uh, that's where that composition and, and uh, being willing to change your composition is, is very valuable. And also you just want to, you just have to know that it just requires going through the process many times. And you will make mistakes, you're always going to make mistakes. That is okay. Sometimes, it's, it sounds trite, but I think it's true that we do learn from our mistakes. Hopefully. As artists, we have to be willing to say, I am not going to make that mistake again. But I am going to learn from the last time that I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to jump into the highlights too early. Or or the features in a portrait too early, or what have you. It's a, there are so many different ways we can get tripped up as artists and as painters. You want to be aware of thick paint in your darks because that can give you a, a negative reflection. Now, I try to avoid just arbitrarily going in and pushing paint around. But if you're just getting finesse on some shapes, that's okay. I also noticed uh, some things down here on this apple. Just chewing up those edges a little tiny bit. Uh, but, but if you can do that with paint rather than just trying to push paint around, you're going to be happier. And a lot of times things do not have to be as crisp as we think they should be. 
We just want them to feel right. So much about painting is about getting the right feeling. And if you can do that with paint, as I say, you'll be better off. Now, we talked about a, a component of painting being uh, edges and paint application. Um, that's where the real sophistication comes in, I believe, on a painting. Uh, something that we respond to, I think, kind of innately is when, uh, when an artist really gets terrific brush work. And that can be manifested in a lot of different ways. Some people, they, they want their paintings to be perfectly smooth. And, and some artists, you want a, a lot of texture and bravura. And like all the things we talk about, you're going to figure out where you fit on that scale. It's just good to be aware of the range of options. So this is a chance to get some of that rich color that I'm seeing up there. In that transition, that's a transition between light and shadow. And you want to resist jumping into those highlights too early. And I think that's one of the reasons that I love this lead white, is that it's, it's heavily bodied enough that I can just shift from colors just by wiping it off on this paper towel. Now notice I don't hold the paper towel, I'm holding my palette. And um, I would not want to be holding the paper towel and getting this lead paint on me, that would not be good. But you may be using zinc white or titanium white, they're all... It's, it, the uh, titanium is much more opaque, uh, much less of a heavy body paint. But as I say, each of these things that I'm dealing with now, I see in increasing levels of complexity. And I can also get richer. This is exactly what I talk about with uh, getting uh, the subject revealing itself to you and leaving yourself somewhere to go. So I believe for the first time I'm going to just grab a little bit of oil and put it into my mixture. And that just gives it a nice, a nice uh, buttery texture to that stroke. And if I make these mixtures. I'm observing, mixing, and laying it down very deliberately, but uh, I want to get a nice thick stroke on there that actually conveys something. I'm not just pushing paint around back and forth. And a lot of times you'll just notice something else somewhere else. Uh, see this little bit of red on here? That's probably overstated. That's okay. I can come back and knock it back. Add into my mixture. Come in a little more opaque. That's such a tricky area because it's going from light to shadow. There's also <clears throat> green over in our apple in shadow back here. And because green, yellowish green, is a warmer color, that's going to advance. So let's see if we can start to make some notes about that. And again, that's not a focal point, so we don't want to get too, too detailed in that distant apple. Even though it's not all that far away, in terms of its, the emphasis we want to put on it, it's just not as much as the others. It's probably too bright. I can knock that back with some richer green that I see around where the stem comes in. You can always mute these greens down with their complement. Red. I promise you that once you paint an apple or something like this, you'll appreciate the way nature has so easily combined these complementary colors.
But try to resist doing more than one or two strokes. A lot of the problems I see when folks are starting to paint, and I've certainly been guilty of this myself, is they're just trying to put, they're trying to get too much out of each stroke. They put something down and they move it and they push it and it ends up just kind of getting thinned out and not saying anything. You're hoping that when you make a stroke at this point, that it really makes a statement. Now remember, we don't want our darks to get too, too thick. We don't want them to have a lot of texture. That will look kind of funny in lighting. The general rule in paint application is let your lights be the thicker thing. Let your darks be thinner. It's almost as though you're painting the light with heavier strokes. It's like if it's getting more light, it's getting more paint. I think that's a I think that you'd find that in much of my work. Those highlights and the areas that are catching a lot of light are going to be the where you got your heaviest paint. And again, like everything I talk about, this is not something I've come up with. If you look at a Rembrandt, you're going to find that that highlight on the nose is the thickest paint that's on there. And that's also true of a Sargent or a Franz Halls. So that's what's great about going around and seeing a lot of work in museums and galleries and even on the internet. You, you learn a lot by seeing. We're visual people, so we learn by seeing. So while I'm not building up a, a real thick layer, I am getting a substantial layer and I'm mixing each stroke pretty much. And hopefully, it's in the ballpark. <clears throat> so when you have a dark, shiny object like this vase, or an eggplant, you can lose that feeling of light and shadow a little bit because everything is just so dark. And that's okay. Because what do we do? We paint what we see. So just let it, trust yourself to capture what's up there and paint what you see. Try to get the perfect color and perfect value. And if there's a reflection, go ahead and put it in. I'm seeing a reflection of the apple up there. So I'm going to get to that in a second. Maybe when I get back into my apples. See, at this point, I don't have a set formula. I'm going to go all over the painting and paint whatever jumps out at me as needing to be addressed. I love one of the things Richard Schmidt says, which is, if there's something wrong on your canvas, get it off. We don't want to leave anything wrong to the best of our ability, because that will be distorting our judgment as we work on important relationships. You know, each of these steps is a little more, a little more finesse involved, a little more detail involved. So if I do something wrong, I want to be careful to get it off of there as quickly as possible. If something doesn't look quite right, just get in there and get it out of there and fix it up. You know, man-made objects can be a little tricky because they're perfect. This is a perfect piece of pottery, perfectly symmetrical. It's not like an apple or even a head. And anybody's going to see if you get the drawing wrong. They might not be able to tell you what's wrong, but they'll be able to tell you that it doesn't look right. <laughs> A lot of critics out there. And a lot of times these things just come to life 
as you continue to paint what you see, not what you think you see or what you think it should look like, but what you're truly seeing up there. I'm seeing a very dark here. Because that's in shadow as it goes away from the light. So put it in. Sometimes you just want to smooth out some of those real dark shapes so that they're not uh, catching the light in an unfortunate way. Well, now would be a good time to look back at the background, too, and just say, is there anything I want to do there? It's feeling very cool. It is cool. But I'm going to just come in and see, take a few strokes and say, can I fix that edge there? I don't want to get too bogged down in it, but... Boy, sometimes I'll spend a good bit of time on something like the lip of this vase. This is so fun! I'm always so happy when I get to this point. Never lose the joy in your painting if you can help it. Even if you're enduring a struggle, just know that you're, you're working towards something of value. And be grateful for these days that we can paint. Now let's get back into the reflections of the apples. Get back into our apple color. I see some rich reds here. They're going to be dark because they're in that dark object. And I remember seeing some up here. 